I will start with a discussion about DevOps. I mean, we can jump on the topic, but it's, I think it's very important for me to also set the, my perspective. And there were a few questions which came in before we started the session. So before we actually deep dive into Git, I really want to set the layout, how the DevOps actually the field is and how the market is and having about my experience and what you can expect from me and uh, where do I come from, what I've worked on and what knowledge and experience I bring in on the table. So going from here, I will actually take two minutes about explaining DevOps. Uh, and I will start with uh, one of the questions because I mean, that's the best way to uh, proceed. So one question was, uh, it was like a person was a database administrator and how DevOps will actually help a database administrator. So, I mean, the answer to that is uh, DevOps and cloud, they are very much linked. Most uh, databases, RDS will be slowly and gradually over the time will be migrated to cloud and also uh, the old traditional databases, uh, they were not distributed. And even if they were distributed, they were had they needed very, very heavy weight lifting and maintenance. So with the new technologies, more lightweight and new technology has come up. Uh, and that that is what DevOps means, is not basically stopping and trying something very new. So DevOps processes discourage you, I mean, uh, from actually using some things which you know it has a problem rather than trying something new and it might give you a problem. So better to go with trying something new and because it's, uh, it's coming up, it's, it's evolving, it will solve your problem as well. So from database administrator, you might learn a new database like new is no SQL, MongoDB, Aurora and other, other DBs. Uh, like Amazon Athena. I mean, these are the databases which probably help in future and there might be new coming up maybe in six months time. I mean, as of today, the technology shelf life is 18 months. So whatever we learn today, there is no assurance that after 18 months that will be valid. So uh, which, which means that uh, DevOps itself is a process of uh, always learning on. So coming back to, I'm going to share, uh, put this slide on. And before, let me just put into presentation. Give me, give me. I think this was probably the slide which uh, you guys have seen very similar to dev and ops. The right part is the dev and the left part is the ops. And like these are various tool chains. So DevOps will actually become a norm in the industry. Most of the companies will move to DevOps because that is the process of uh, releasing a uh, quick release of software cycle. So slowly and gradually, uh, almost every software company will move on DevOps tool chain. And what is, this is called in industry as a digital transformation. It's not just Dev DevOps combined with cloud and uh, microservices will actually together brings a digital transformation to any organization. And all the organization as of today, sooner or later will have to go through this digital, digital transformation. Companies which are leading this path will basically be successful and they will hire the new talents and company who are lagging behind, they will actually have to bear the cost of legacy software and they will, they will see their revenues and their profits shrinking, and they will have to jump on the train later point of time. So for, from our individual point of view, from technical people point of view, sooner or later, all, most of the job requirements will make this as a de facto standard that you should know at least few of the technology. So I'm going to name a few of them, which is as of today in job specification are requested having almost interviewed many, many engineers for DevOps. So it's like you need to have a few knowledge of cloud. So there is public cloud like AWS, Azure, and GCP. 
but there is also private cloud, which is like OpenStack and VMware. So you need to have know what the cloud is, what is private, what is public. Like uh, government doesn't like to get involved in the public cloud because of security. So they build their own public cloud, private clouds. You need to know at least one DevOps language, which is either Python, Go, or JavaScript. You can, I mean, if you if you don't know any of them, it's not a problem. The idea behind is, is that this is something uh, you need to, uh, it will help you in a quick learning if you know them. If you don't know them, it's not a problem. We are here basically to address all these issues. We are, we are not going to like cover each one what I'm telling about this because what I'm telling is DevOps, cloud plus microservices all together. And, and that's, that's where if you have all these three skills together, that makes an ideal candidate to be hired and makes, makes an industry expert as well. Just one aspect of it, uh, it means you you solve one piece of puzzle, but you don't solve the entire entire uh, problem. But if you have all three of uh, three three areas of knowledge, you can have a very very high level architect level view, and you can understand why this is needed. Yeah. So uh, there are there are two more questions. So before I will just finish what I'm where I'm at, and I will pick up the questions later on. So I can see there are a few questions. Then there will be you. Uh, infrastructure as a code and for that there is ansible and terraform and there are other as well i'm just naming the ones which are market leader that doesn't mean these are the only available tools in the market there are so many out there and it doesn't mean that this is the one has to be known but from an individual point of view i am mentioning which is actually most widely used most stable and best available in the market so that's why i'm naming those ones then uh, you will need a CI CD pipeline tool, which will be either Jenkins, Team City, or Octopus. Uh, you need a monitoring tool, something like Grafana, Nagoyce, Datadog, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, you name it, there are many. Then you need something like uh, very, very basic Docker, Docker containers. Now there are also, uh, apart from Docker container, there are like a proprietary container from Open uh, Red Hat. Reddit launched their own containers. And once you know the dockers and the containers, it's by default as like expected every DevOps engineer to know the Kubernetes or any kind of cluster orchestration, or you can say the container orchestration. But Kubernetes is not the only container orch orchestrator in the market. There is uh, Docker Swarm, there is Console, there are other providers as well. So there is no one size fits all every customer requirement has to be analyzed and understood and then solution has to be suggested apart from that you will need uh, like basic tools like jira confluence for collaboration you will need uh, an identity management tool something like uh, okta or uh, oauth you will need understanding of microservices architecture what actually it means to be a microservice microservices and like something like messaging bus, which is like Kafka and Vault, because when you're working on cloud, there is no way you can put passwords in files, in text files, or no way you can encrypt the password and then keep the keys somewhere in your configuration file. So for that reason, we need Vault, which actually saves all the password and securely. So like apart from this, there are a few others as well, like uh, Elastic, Logstack, and Kiwana, ELK, centralized logging, which is essentially a very, very key part of microservices architecture-based de development. There, apart from, I'm coming back to the cluster, Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes cluster is open source, but there are enterprise version of the clusters like OpenShift, and there are other companies which have actually commercialized this on top of it. So Red Hat has basically taken the open source code and actually named it as OpenShift. Now they call it as OKD from version four. So, I mean, these are like few of them. I'm not saying these are, this is an exhaustive list, but every tool of this has a certain function. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to know all of them. It's like, 
if you know Excel, you know Google Sheet, you know numbers. So you don't have to actually go and learn all three differently. So they, they actually solve the same purpose in the industry, but they are provided by the different providers. So don't, don't hesitate when, when somebody says, okay, uh, like we are doing puff and shuffet, puppet and shuffet, uh, sorry, chef and puppet. So don't hesitate, it's the same thing. They will do configuration management for you. So if you know one, you probably very, very quickly can pick up the another one. So the concept will remain the same. But if you have actually worked on three months in, in Chef, then obviously your knowledge on Chef will be much more than your working knowledge on Puppet. But what it means is that at any point of time, you can actually pick up Puppet, not in three months, maybe in just two weeks, because you already know uh, what functionality to expect from it. Uh, so coming back to my questions, I will pick a few questions and then jump on the kit. So there was this question is I'm from uh, telecom engineer and how DevOps helps. So basically it for telecom word is going through a very, very, uh, trans very, very crazy phase of transformation. Many of the clients are doing their digital transformation journey, which means apart from what is happening in cloud, and DevOps, they are also going through, which is called SDN and an NFP. And SDN, so that is a software defined network, and NFP is a network function virtualization. And these are actually implemented in cloud. So rather than they having their own private cloud, few, few telecom providers, they are going with their own private cloud, which means you need to understand OpenStack. And for to operate any kind of cloud, you need DevOps tool chain. So which means that's how it will engage. And few telecom providers are using public cloud to build their SDN. Cisco itself has their own SDN product, but there are other as well. Nokia has their own SDN product. And what these telecom providers are doing is they are actually deciding whether they want to go public or private. And on top of it, they are putting an SDN network. And then on that on the top, they can scale a microservices based application. So for a telecom engineer point of view, uh, that's that's the future where it will go. Now coming to a big data engineer. So for a big data engineer, a DevOps tool chain is, is the only option. I mean, because yeah, really the, previously the big data engineer was uh, uh, more into a Chef kind of file system, which is Chef and Hadoop. But uh, now people are thinking like uh, Kinesis and Firehoses, which means that you can actually process everything real time. There's no need to store large amount of data, but actually the comp you can uh, on demand increase your compute and do the processing. So from that point of view, yes, uh, it, it will move. Most of the IT technologies and the companies, they will move to DevOps tool chain along with cloud and microservices architecture. Yeah, so there is one more question is, uh, I mentioned Python, Go, and JavaScript, where these languages come handy. So all these tool chain I'm talking about, they need an integration. All these tools, which we talked about, they interact with each other. And when they interact with each other, we will have to basically use an API. And in order to write an API, either we will be using Python, Go, or JavaScript. So that's where these language comes handy. So for example, you have to integrate, let's say, uh, automation of spinning of infrastructure. Let's say you are using Terraform and you want to write a, basically a Terraform. Terraform itself has its own language, but let's say Ansible. Ansible uh, has its own, own format, but generally you will, so at some point of time, you will integrate all those pieces and you will need your own action orchestrator. That means spin the VM, spin the EC2 or, or a instance on a cloud, then install certain, uh, okay. So a certain package and then application and those those action orchestration will be done by Python, Go, or JavaScript. So I mean that's that's basically in a nutshell about uh, uh, DevOps. What it means we are and the idea as, as Sandeep said is the idea is not basically to rush you through, is basically to take your time, understand, and wherever we have the gaps, we need to basically address the gaps, and. Um, I have a working, okay, I'll come back to my introduction later on. So now anyway, well, let's focus on today's course. 
So today what we are going to cover is get, before we actually jump on the, the course content, let's do a few admin stuff. So uh, this is a like two hour session with a 10 minutes break. Uh, I expect this is the case with everyone. Uh, so uh, this is two hour. If somebody has a uh, miscommunication, I mean, we can discuss offline and, and see what we can do. Uh, so everybody is on mute and it's just for the benefit, but if someone wants to ask a question, he can unmute himself, ask a question if, if uh, you cannot type. If you can type, as you know, already I'm looking at the chats and I'm answering the question. Don't wait till the end, you can interrupt in middle. I would like to stop there, address the query and then move on. Uh, if for any reason I cannot answer the query on the spot, I will take it back with me and I will, on, on the first five minutes of next session, I will be answering those questions. Uh, okay, let me try to hide it. Yes, you can ask question offline. There is no better time to ask question when you have it in your time. You can, when you, when you have it in your head, you can drop an email, you can send a message. If whenever the question comes to you, by all means, send it, send it through. Uh, I'm not sure how do I hide this. Okay, is it is it better? The screen. Okay. Right. So let me. See. Just go ahead. Second, just go to the right. So uh, we'll have five hands-on labs. So if you are using a laptop, it's good. Uh, if you are on mobile, you will be able to see myself doing an exercise. But I mean, if you do it along with me, I mean, I'm sure uh, we'll hit some problems. And and the idea is not. So I have not made the. I've tried to make the lab as clear as possible. I'm expecting certain level of uh, uh, knowledge uh, in terms of Unix and other things from everyone. But if you don't know, by all means, uh, I will be running it on my setup. Uh, I will be also running it on Windows, I mean, for today. Uh, and if we, if we get stuck, I mean, more problem we get during the hands-on, the better it is, because then that's where we learn the most. The recording of the slides will be shared after the session. And please, by, by all means, more question you ask, it benefits everyone in the session. So don't shy away. And and I'm no, if I cannot answer, as I said, I will try to answer in the next session. Now, what is the agenda for today? We will see what is an objective of the session for today. We will discuss about what is version control and source control management. Uh, what is get and why get only. Then we will go and do a first lab. First lab is basically uh, installing get. So getting ready. The, the second, uh, then we will go through the fundamental of the gates. How does the gate work? What are the various commands? How do you operate on gate? Then we'll have lab two, basically to try all those commands, which we have studied in fundamental. Then the most powerful feature of the gate is gate branching. And we will uh, practice on gate branching in lab three and lab four. And then we look at how we can collaborate using it. And that will be lab five. Now, the main objective, the, the, I have one objective, principal motto behind this session was, I wanted people to have to learn the ability to contribute in any open source project. Now this is seen as a very, very vital skill in area of DevOps. Gone are the days where we had the manager sitting on top of it, assigning the work. Now these are the days where people look for self-motivated people, which means if you have an idea, if you have the knowledge, then there is basically uh, no one can stop you. And you can actually go and work in an open source. You can work for a company, you can work for yourself. And people who have actually contributed in open source project because most of the good DevOps tool chain, whatever I mentioned, like Ansible is open source, OpenShift, Kubernetes is open source. 
So these tools are all open source. And if you have the skill and you can contribute in this kind of product uh, products, you will be regarded as a very, very good technical individual. So if you can, if you can contribute in this, these projects. OpenShift has two uh, versions. So there is an upstream which is called okay, uh, OpenShift Origin. Origin is open source, but OpenShift is enterprise. You don't need an AWS or GCP account for the session. You can run most of the things on your laptop. Right. Uh, no, we will, not, we will be mostly using open source. We will not be using any kind of enterprise version software. And that's, that's the idea of uh, DevOps tool chain because if you can imagine Git, Git itself took uh, like uh, two, three years of cycle to develop, but most of the DevOps tool chain ha has come up in last 18 months. And it's just because of the fact that they were all open source, most of them were open source. So they end up uh, uh, having faster development cycle. Right, so we will see Git collaboration, Lab 5, and Git workflow. So, so one takeaway I want from everyone is after this session, go and don't shy away from trying any kind of public repo. If you can contribute on a public repo, which means you, you know how to contribute in the public repo. And if you have the skills and you understand the product, you are on the right track. That that is that is one of the one of the ticks in the boxes out of many boxes. So you you have the right skills and the development attitude. So I have uh, I'm founder of a freelance organization called Tejastack. I have worked for digital transformation for tele big telecom operators uh, like Airtel, Vodafone in UK. Uh, I have worked for Murak Telecom, Telefonica Germany. I worked for major telecom vendors, apart from that, uh, I've also worked for uh, NFVs. Uh, so th that's where my uh, digital transformation experience comes in, which involved not only the DevOps, but also the cloud and the microservices transformation as well. Uh, so I've worked on large scale computing and also, and I've graduated from IIT Roorkee as a computer science graduate. So, so this is the after once we have finished this session, these are the things which you which you can do comfortably. You can install Git on any platform, be it Windows, Mac, or Linux. You can comfortably use Git commands for your development work, which means you will be able to uh, like do a checkout or create a new branch, or, uh, do the development of your code, then commit the code in a local repository, push it back to the server repository and then if there is a release cycle you understand how the release cycle would be and you can merge your code you can experiment with any public available git repository so so you might have heard people saying as okay everything is open source this is open source that is open source and they're so excited about it but how do i use it how do i actually use the open source so git is actually one of the best tools to use it so it just takes like few minutes to have the open source code in your local laptop. And then you can actually use that code, and modify, first of all, run as, as it is intended in the document. And then once you understand the, the code, you can actually adapt it to your specific need. So I will tell you a business use case for this one. For example, why it is important when you go looking for a job. So let's say there is a there is an organization and who are trying to develop a feature in a product and uh, that feature is basically is using is is building an api uh, for a product so that uh, exposing an an api interface for their existing product so they will come back and say you know what we need to develop an api interface and you will say okay let's start designing from this scratch but then you might go and look uh, in open source has anybody developed an api interface already and you very, very strangely, when you start looking on open source, you will see there are so many APIs interface have been developed and not only in Python, in JavaScript, in Perl. So in Go, so in fact, you will see the same product has been de developed in different languages. So whichever language is your comfortable language or you, you have an expertise, you can actually copy the code 
and then understand the code. So maybe in two, three days, you have a baseline code to work on. And you only need to work on few interfaces, which will basically achieve the task. What it means is code reusability is, is achieved from an open source point of view. So this is where this kit is going to help in terms of how to use an open source repo for your individual cases. And this is applicable for business. And this is also applicable for individual. If you want to run a, like do a small project, you want to do something using a small project, you can do exactly the same. So once you have a local copy, then it is like your code. Every open source code is published under GPL license, general public license, which means you can use it for your purpose. And you can also use it for production as long as you made, make the code. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you understand what is general public license means. What the general public license means is you take an open source code, you download it on your local laptop, you add a few features and functionality to it, and you make it a product out of it. And when you make a product out of it, you can sell it to a customer, to a business. And when you sell it, you will make money. But then the pur purpose of the open source is defeated. But here comes the general purpose license. What it says is, whatever feature you have added onto the public repo, you will have to make it public. So your feature, which you are selling, you will have to commit it back into the open source, which means next person can use your feature for free. Now, again, what it means is then somebody, your competitor might basically copy the same open source code and offer the same services. Yes, that's true. That's basically the hindsight of using the open source. If you don't want to do it, then basically you have to go back to enterprise. But if your feature or your product is based on an open source code, you will have to make your code available into the open source. You might delay it. This is what actually Red Hat does it their own internal version basically is actually two or three version ahead of what is in the public repo. So this is how people, uh, this is how the company manages it is their, their enterprise code is actually one release ahead of the open source code. So that's, and, and people will come to you for the support. So that's the model of Red Hat. Now, the next thing is uh, individual is uh, next step is submit development feature releases in an open source project. So this, the case I was discussing was you took the local repo, you developed a new feature, and then you made a product, you can sell it, which is fine. But what you can also do is as an individual contributor, you say, okay, fine, I, I, I want this product to behave in this way as well. This is a missing functionality. So you download the product, you add the switching functionality, and then you basically submit that this is a very good functionality, nice to have in the, in the product, and you will submit it into the open source project, and there will be an administrator of that repo, and you will have a, like a back and forth discussion with the administrator, and if he agrees, he will basically merge or change into the product. Like what we see is uh, Git releases, product releases coming up in every three months, six months times, so what will happen in, in those releases, these features and these uh, open source people have contributed. And because of that, they, these new releases have new, funct new functions. I mean, the, I will tell you the power of open source contribution. There were two, like you, you, you might have heard VMware and OpenStack. Now VMware was far much bigger than Red Hat, OpenStack. But just because Red Hat, OpenStack, is an open source. Basically, it is an enterprise version of DevStack, and DevStack is an open source. DevStack has far, far much feature capabilities than VMware and is now leading the market in private cloud. It is an open source, and VMware is still not open source, it's an enterprise. So, gone are the days where we will say that enterprise software uh, will have passive, basically have faster development. So, as long as uh, there is a critical mass of contribution in an open source project, that open source project will always surpass the enterprise. So why uh, we're coming back now, we will deep dive into just Git. We're coming out of all those uh, high level things, but let's look into Git only right now. Let's focus just on Git. So version control, why do we actually need? So 
everything we need in DevOps and in and right now in tool chain is there is a question is why do we need it? Why can't we do it without it? That is the first question we should ask ourselves is why actually I need it? If I can work without it, why shouldn't I work without it? So version control is has been long, long back. It's not something new is any kind of development we want to do is sometimes we will make some changes in the code and we might do wrong changes and we want to roll back and all those things. So you want to always refer to a previous copy of the code or, or the working file. It can be a Word document, PowerPoint, slides, code, anything, any repository. So, I mean, there are basically this three kinds of uh, version control. One is a local, like when I was preparing this slide, uh, I had everything in the local maintained as a version. So I can revert back. So this is like a very crude way of doing it, centralized. Uh, it's an old uh, version control we used to have CVS or SPN. Uh, and where it happens is every all the files are on the central server. Every time you want to edit a file, you basically pull the file from the server, edit the file and push it back. The problem with that was is it used to take a lot of network bandwidth. And every time if, if you are offline, you cannot basically do the code development. The third option is distributed. What it means is everybody is having a local copy, local copy of the repository, and they are working on the local copy. And only when they are actually trying to sync on the server repository, they will have to work on merging the conflicts. If there is any, if there is no conflict, like uh, computer A has file one and computer B has file two, but they are two independent file, then they can push their file onto the the, the server, and there will be no conflict. So that's why need. And why actually what help does provide uh, by the version control is, I mean, this is something which is very basic and every version control system is expected to have this is like backup and restore. They should automatically backup the file without, uh, I mean, user telling it or user trying to do a commit in this case, and you can restore it. Synchronization, if you want to share a, file with the user then you should be able to share like do a parallel development which is what say, synch uh, synchronization is you should be able to do an undo for example you're working on your feature but sometimes the feature are big and you have actually two or three days of work and and you you took a break and when you came back uh, you actually raised something or you, you basically developed something or write or wrote a code which actually broke your previous days work and you want to work to the previous days so that short term undo is is possible long term undo is like every time there are like say 10 developers working in a team and one of the developer basically checks in his code and it breaks nightly build so which means it's a big impact uh, from from an organization point of view that uh, if uh, uh, the nightly builds are breaking so they will actually revert back to the previous working version of the, the repo and the developer will basically fix his uh, like bug or whatever the issue was and submit it again the next is like we need to track changes like in the previous case when the nightly builds are failing then uh, then the person should be able to identify whose check-in has actually break in the build who was the last check-in and so all those people can be identified and, and notified that please look into your code. So you should be able to identify track changes for what purpose it was made and who made it at what time. Uh, then track ownership, every commit is named with the, like every time you do a commit, there is always a person name with it. It's also a sandbox. Every time you basically uh, uh, do a git clone or git, uh, git in it, you make a local copy of the repo and here you, in, in your local laptop, you can actually remove, add, do whatever you like. You can actually combine two different repo to build a third repo, which will do a third functionality. And if it doesn't work, let's say you tried basically half a day trying to integrate two different repo and it is not working and you basically realize that it is impossible. It is not even feasible to make them work. Then basically you can stash it. You can basically throw it in the bin and and start from scratch without losing anything. And in the end is branching and merging, which is the most powerful feature. Uh, let me see if I can show the text. So what, what it means is basically you can clone the code locally, create a branch, which means 
the code which is on the central server is left intact you have a local code and let's say you develop a one feature or two feature generally there is it's, it's a recommendation best practices practice is to have one feature per branch and you develop your brand you develop your feature in the branch you test it you make sure everything is working fine and then what you say is i want to basically put this feature into the back into the main branch and where basically you will start the merge or the pull request and it will merge into the code so that's that's basically what the source control management and the version control will provide so it's again uh, source control management let me let me take this question is the git server geographically ge geographically redundantly available consider a scenario where primary git server crashes and the files are not yet synced to a secondary server at some point of time my local repository i have not synced the files from the primary server does it mean that i have to rework uh, the update and update the files in the primary repository once the server comes back so yeah git server is actually it's i'm not sure whether it is geographically redundant or not but i we have not seen any instances where it has crashed so it's not actually a git server it will be uh, one of the ui server you might be using something like uh, github or gitlab or bitbucket so git actually has two part of it so one is git software itself which will be on your local and you will be using a ui where you will maintain the server code base which will be either github gitlab or bitbucket these are like uh, very well hosted sites so yes they will have geographically redundant availability so it's very very rare that you will have uh, those server crashing it's server crashing uh, and they will have their own backup so i i really don't see that happening uh, so but if for example your local repository will crash you can always sync from the server repo server it's very very rare for a server repo to crash now coming back to uh, source control management the purpose is that uh, mainly tell now what we discussed before was more mainly uh, one person trying to develop a code uh, while uh, other is working independent but source control management also allows the same functionality to be extended for n number of users which can be ranging from 5 to 10 to 1000 right so basically and then all those users should be able to undo their changes the server administrator repo should be a uh, repo administrator should be able to undo the changes if somebody has done then the wrong commits or corrupted the file he should be able to revert back protect his repository and uh, whenever there is a need of communication between the developer uh, the communication is already started by the source control management which means if there are two files which have a conflicting change a scm will not let them merge it and it will give the message to be written to the to the submitter and the person who is approving the pr there are different merging strategy, which we will also discuss at the time of pull request. Uh, we'll just pick two questions. Uh, who hosts this repo server and who pays for the cost of it? So these are companies like GitHub. Uh, if you know, GitHub was actually uh, free and open source like Wikipedia thing. Uh, so it was, but it was bought by Microsoft because the value of the code which was there I think it was bought for a very high price a few years back. And because many open source contributors did not like that happening, that they don't want their code to be becoming proprietary. Although Microsoft, I think, made the commitment that they will not uh, make it proprietary uh, because when they bought it, everybody, all the users were thinking that this is open source and it will be open source forever. So many of them, they moved to GitLab. Right now, GitLab is an open source uh, repo server hosting. Uh, Bitbucket again. It's not Bitbucket is not a uh, open source, and uh, it's uh, used for enterprise. So if there is a big company they want to basically have a server hosted, they can go with Bitbucket. They can actually spin up a new instance of Bitbucket for that organization. That means nobody else outside that organization can access that code. Right. Yes, you can maintain a, so there is a question is, is it possible to maintain a private Git repo 
or do we have to use one of the okay so i think this question is a bit uh, not clear yet. when you say private git repository uh, what it means is you only have the access to the code so yes you don't need any of the github gitlab or bitbucket to have you can just do git in it and you can work locally so which which means you will have all the functionality of the version control and source code management but your code will not be available uh, on the internet so for example if your laptop crashes you will lose your code so that is why what people do is they you have an account on gitlab or any any of the public repo and they they push the code on on a public hosted uh, repo so that if they lose the local laptop they can still have their copy of the code globally right let's move to the next question okay then so let's let's move to the next slide so what exactly git is so git is is a distributed a version control and it is used for i mean tracking changes in source code it is also used for coordinating work and with git you can actually track any change which has been done from the start of the repo it also maintains integrity which means every time there is a commit it basically runs a checksum and it uses sha256 to calculate the checksum and it is also very much nicely supported for non linear workflows which means let's say you have a five what what it means by non linear workflow is if you have five contributors today but you realize in one month you have like 100 contributors so from the point of view of scaling your version control system you don't have to do anything you just have to give a contribution access of your repo to those many people now how does git achieve this because there were uh, version control before git and they they basically were not that efficient and they were slow so uh, this slide basically explains as how git has actually managed to achieve git is right now the de facto standard for the industry it has actually killed the competition of all other version control which were available so right now nobody will ask you that you know mercurial or you know svn or you know cvs nobody will even ask for that so how does git get achieve this is git creates the snapshot it doesn't work on the delta all the previous version control used to maintain the delta i mean the idea was previously that you only store uh, less amount of data and uh, so only the delta every time there is a change in the file the change was saved and in order to create the last file you have to start building the file from the scratch from the version 1 till the version 4 for in this case let's say so imagine if over the period of time it will definitely become slow and as the code base will increase these kind of version control or the source code management tools will basically become slower and slower which makes the development slower again what git did is git basically started creating snapshots of file for every version it will create a snapshot not only of the file it will also create a snapshot of the tree it will also create a snapshot for the commit next question is from rick is does the owner of the repo con control the allowed commit from the other contributors to the repo okay so the commit is done in the local repo so the way the git works is maybe we when we cover more slide that question will become more relevant but i think the 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 question you want to ask is is that can anybody make the changes in the repo uh, without the permission of the, the repo controller the answer is no every time there is a there is a code that goes into the main so okay maybe let me let me explain there are two things of it so when uh, on a on a hosted repository there will be branches which will not be merged so when an individual contributor is working on his local branch he can push the changes to his branch on the hosted repository but until that branch is merged into the main branch master branch or the developed branch that change will not be available for release for a general availability so what it means is yes 
he can push it the changes into the rep, into the hosted repository in his branch but he cannot merge it into the master that is controlled by the repo controller so he will request for submission of his change into the main product but the acceptance will be done by the repo controller but if let's say some third person wants to use this feature he can actually pick up the master branch and then uh, check out his branch and then do his changes and start working which means is nobody is stopping anyone publicly to use his branch feature even though it is not uh, merged but it will be a bit more hassle it will not be very smooth for a third person to use it feature. so i will come back to this commit uh, confusion so commit is always in git is done on the local repo all the commit done is is not on the on the hosted repository it is on the local repository on the local host there is a command push and when the command push is done then that commit has is pushed on the hosted repo till that time everything is in the local scm and scm okay scm is actually source control management which is like any tool uh, what we are discussing like there are three kind of scm distributed centralized and uh, the local svn is one it was one of the version control product like git it was uh, probably used in like seven eight years ago so there are two different things uh, svn was actually version, uh, version control uh, so scm is a general industry term which is for source control management okay uh, now the next question is when you uh, when you say git takes a snapshot it is taking a checksum of the entire bundle no i think they are okay so let's not confuse with the checksum and the snap snapshot and checksum are two different thing a snapshot is actually taking the uh, taking the image taking a picture of that file something like this and then saving it for example if you remember in older times there was a there was a functionality called hibernate or even we do a snapshot of a disk as of today so you have a working disk and you want to back up a disk you will uh, do a snapshot which is very quick way of backing up the, the disk which means it will actually take up on that instant what was the state of the disk it's a very quick process and it's like uh, creating a memory map but what checksum is checksum is actually uh, making sure whatever you have saving is valid so checksum will in check for the data integrity so whatever is snapshot you have taken when you want to restore it it is going to work you have, when you have copied it from one place to another it is exactly the same it has not changed right so most of the questions are answered so there are like three more questions so there's one is from sohas is for every feature there will be a new branch more feature more branch after the merge can branch be dissolved uh, there is no reason to dissolve it because the branch is very very lightweight uh in git because what is actually a branch branch is actually a pointer to the snapshots saved so as we discuss more we will come to see the branch is a very very lightweight and very least expensive way of creating it so there is actually no need to basically remove the branch uh, you can actually remove the branch if you want but uh, there is no need once but once the branch is merged i think it's better to keep it there because there are always future references for the merged branches there will be always hanging branches which are not merged and if somebody wants to remove them definitely they can clean that up uh, so there is a new question as consider a case where i'm working on say five branches at one time by checking out the respective branch required in this case how is the physical copy saved as in details of branches can be seen in the file explorer uh, okay i think we will we'll come to that into the next section these questions will be answered uh, uh as we move on to the to the git section i mean if uh, i know if people who have worked in previous version controls like clear case svn or other cvs tool the commit meaning of that commit meaning in those system and git commit is completely different so don't confuse with those commits because those commits were actually gone into the main the branches but here everything is, is on the local repo uh, i will we will we'll discuss more once we get into the the get uh and so on uh so there is a question in two person i think these questions are i think we need to cover the basic things so there is a question which is 
what if the two person did clone the same master and by the time first master did change and the second master already committed sin now again okay i think this is a very very uh, good question and this is generally the scenario we will cover um, svn is centralized version control uh, i'm not sure i mean at this google but it's one of the version control which is not distributed yeah so it might be uh, uh, need some more explanation on checksum and snapshot okay so a snapshot is is a is a picture of the memory image of that file at that point of time and checksum is when you copy that from one place to another you run a algorithm to create a crc and when you move from one place to another you make sure that those file have exactly the same during the transfer no bit has flipped which means when you try to read that file you will be able to successfully read that file it's is called data integrity which means that during the process of snapshot or copying or storing the snapshot the data has not been changed so that's the the purpose of integrity a snapshot uh, this is uh, i mean the, the question is does the snapshot take more storage than the delta between the files i mean it's just a subjective thing is depending upon how big the delta is but uh, the snapshot is generally the uh, generally the size of the file yeah, should be somewhere similar but uh, what we are saying is uh, these were problems before of the storage now today uh, most of the codes are like in text they are not binaries which means that uh, creating a snapshot is not a problem and the storage has gone into to terabytes so i think uh, the recommended size of any repository is not to be in gigabits if your repo size is going in gigabits the advice is to break them into two repo because even the code architecture is recommended for microservices so the the new norm is build small pieces of code which can interact with each other so build microservices and the microservices can interact with each other and then they can scale to serve more uh, customers so the idea is uh, having a repo which is more than a gigabit will be a concern that uh, it the development is actually not a microservices development or probably it's going back into a legacy route so that's the answer for uh yeah. so let's come back to slides so i mean a bit of a bit of a history on how git came into the picture so i think git uh, git uh, was uh, evolved uh for linux kernel so there was a linux kernel project so linux kernel was being developed and there was a lot of it was an open source again linux kernel was open source and there was a lot of contribution and the problem statement was how many people can contribute uh, to this kernel project we and in and a version control was needed which was a bitkeeper now bitkeeper made it free for uh, people who were working on the linux kernel project as a courtesy but like in 2005 bitkeeper was so popular that somebody bought it and they said as okay it will no more be free and the open source community basically came up and said okay we will create our own uh, version control our own source control management and which will actually meet these requirements which is the idea was it should be fast so if you do any if you right now if you do a git clone for any big repo you will see it's not taking that much time at least at as it used to take before it can support non linear development that means thousands of people can contribute with their independent branches fully distributed that means everybody will have their own copy they are not dependent they can work offline even if you don't have an internet you can work online do your changes commit your changes when you have an internet you can push so there is no uh, limitation for anyone to do the development work and ability to handle large product large projects so if the code base is big it should stay so in 2005 lenis troward i think everybody knows him he was the creator of the linux kernel he developed git and with this concept of a snapshot 
and only maintaining the pointers of the snapshots, he achieved all of the above. So I'll come back to the next slide is, uh, this is again version control uh, centralized and here all the changes must be pushed to the central server and the issue was the speed. If somebody is having a poor uh, internet connectivity, then it will be a problem, it will be slow and if there is no offline access. And the distributed, I think we have already discussed it, so I'll skip this slide. Uh, I think this we have also uh, covered what is version control. So get get actually what we were discussing is what should be the offer of source control management and get basically offers everything what we have discussed above. So we'll skip the slide and move on to the nep, nep, the first lab of the day, which is uh, installing the Git on your local. And yeah. We can use any of the repo hosting services, either GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, any of them. But I would say for for today, I mean for the for the purpose of lab, you can use GitHub. And I mean, don't shy away. You should, can create your account on GitLab or Bitbucket as you wish. I mean, I have no personal favorites to any any of those uh, UI hosted. So, uh, well. Show, uh, show this lab of installation. So what we will do right, right now is this is the source for, we click on this link. And this is the page for Git. You can download the client. So, I need to Mac. If if anybody, I mean, uh, I just want to see uh, people who want to vote for whether they want to go for Mac or Windows. Yeah, thanks. We know. Thanks. So here you can see you can download it for Mac, Windows, or Linux, depending upon which version you are. Yeah, you can go with selecting uh, all the default option when you are doing Windows. Okay, let me do it on Windows. I have spin. I will spin up the machine. There is an easy way of doing it if you have a if you have a Python installed on uh, your Mac, you can just do pip install git, and this is actually going to bring the latest version. So it's 220, this was 223. Yeah, okay, the link. While Windows is coming up, we'll check the version now. So it's 223, it's updated from 20 to 23. So this version is over 10, which means I've got the, the working version of the grid on my local. Uh, we'll Meanwhile, I will continue to the next step of the session. So here, this is the task one, which was installation. So this was the example output for 20, but now we have 23 version, which is the latest one. Now once we have it, the idea is to basically generate your key and then add your key into your SSH agent. So this is sign up on the GitHub. I already have an actual, already a sign up account. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new key. I can have multiple keys on my account. So I will just create a new key and add it. So, so once once you have an account, you will have something like this, your, your welcome page. And click here uh, and go to settings. I mean, I've shown that in the screen as well. And you go in this SSH and GPD keys here. So you can see there is already a key here, but I can add 
new as well. So I can say new SSH key. And this is a place I will have to add on the GitLab, GitHub. But I, before that, I need to create an existing or I can use a I can use an existing one or I can create a new one. So uh, for people who are actually starting from scratch, they will have to either from, from Windows, they will have to create one. If you're on a Linux or a Mac, you might already have a key because you might have generated for something else. So if you already have a file in your dot ssh directory and which is called id.rsa.pub you can use that key existing key and you can paste it here so this is the content which needs to be posted once you have generated but if you don't have it there's no problem with that you can actually create it if you are on a mac or on a linux you will have a default utility ssh key gen you specify minus t okay that's in the slide as well so if i go back uh, if you go on this next slide so this is the key this is also available when you download git bash on windows you have this command available in git bash as well so use this command to generate a new key this is what i'm going to do just copy it from here also test my command Uh, generally, what it means is the T option here is tells what algorithm to use and minus B is what is the size of encryption. So it's re recommended as part of security is to use minimum 4096. By default, is I think uh, 2048. Uh, I really don't want to overwrite my existing key, so I'll just create a new one. You can give the passphrase if you like, but you can leave it empty. And now I will have this two files, which is uh, DevOps Lab and DevOps Lab Pub. So this is my key now. I can do more of this. I can do run a more command if you show me the content. Then I can copy paste this uh, into my this is screen SSH key, and here I can add. And now, okay, uh, it has added a new key, which is this one. And it basically can check this was last used in last week, and this is never used. I've never used this key so far. So once I have done this, I mean, for me, it will be working before as well. So this is not a test, but I can. And I can I can do a git clone here, uh, and I will use this. I will use this command to git clone exactly same as it is here. Yeah. So this will this should actually. So this what the command is. Let, let's discuss a bit of a command. So what this command is, I have created a repo called web server. So let's have a look at this repo before we actually do something. So if I go here into my repo and I've created this web server, this is a small web server I've created as a part of a lab. And this is actually the source code is a repository. And I have made this as a public repo, which means anybody can actually contribute. Anybody can actually clone it. And it's not a private and when i will clone it all these files whatever is here inside static inside templates you see there are a few files in templates all those files will be copied into my local directory so, so right now i have a folder called web server which is the name of the repo and and you see here is it showing me I'm in the master branch at the moment. And showing me the list files here. Let me just see here. So you can see showing me readme, app.py, app1, app2, static, and templates, which is like this here. And if I go on templates, and if I do see templates, 
I have about an index.html. So that's the git clone. What I have done is I've actually uh, I've actually copied the local repo. Okay, so fine people are asking about uh, what is SSH, okay. Right, so fine, this is the Mac. Let's let's do this from the scratch on Windows. So this is our paper source. We got this Windows, brand new Windows machine uh, instance running. It has nothing. Uh, so let me just launch and show you. So there is no GitHub at the moment. I'm going to, no, there is no Git. So Windows guys can follow me now from here. So you say yes, we need to do the installation. Okay, uh, if uh, just following the default uh, options for Git installation for Windows, we have seen it on the Linux uh, on the Mac. And now we're doing it on Windows. I mean, the idea of what we're trying to do is we are, we're trying to have a local software of Git running on the host. And this software is going to connect to the hosted repo. That is and what we are trying to set up the mechanism. So here it's Git bash, I can use this. And Git bats itself has a SSH key gen, so I can copy from here. Okay, it's not letting me copy, I will type. And by default, it is going to store it in .ssh underscore id dot sra, that, that is the default name. And this file is created. And you can do dot SSH here. Okay, it's stuck. Okay, so because git bash doesn't have more command. So this is the key that has to go on GitHub account. So I will just log in from here. Everybody following me, right? If any anyone need, is stuck, uh, please, uh, by all means, or if you want me to skip, everybody has done it. So let's not waste time. You can jump on to the, the next one. Ah, okay. Yeah, so we create the key on our client machine. Yes, correct. Uh, and this is the key we will go, uh, add on GitHub. Yeah, that understanding is correct, Prasoon. And uh, it was fast for Windows. Can you go, please go back? So, I mean, well, this is what we did. Uh, so we installed Git. Once we installed uh, Git, we launch a program which is called Git Bash. Actually, it's a Bash terminal uh, provided by Git software. So we came to this Bash terminal. Inside the Bash terminal, we have executed uh, this command, which is SSH key gen exe with the command which I pasted on this chat window. Uh, and this will actually create the key. Uh, all these options you have to just press enter enter by use the default option and in the end it will generate this key called id.sra id underscore id sa rsa dot pub two files so these keys are generated what you need is there are two keys one is private one is public the file which ends with dot pub which is a public key you cat that file and the content of that file actually goes on the web page of github website where you created or you signed up for your login 
So go on to that. Then that's what I was trying to do for the next step is signing, logging onto the GitHub and adding this key. And then I can actually do Git clone even from this Windows machine because right now this Windows machine and my GitHub account are not linked. So in order to link this Windows machine and my GitHub account, I will have to add this key. And this is what I will show you. I will show where in GitHub I'm logging now. So I already have an account, so I will do sign in. Yes, cat command is to read the file content. You can also use uh, uh, more, uh, but the git bash doesn't have the more command. But if you are on a Mac or a Linux, you can use either more cat, vi, any kind of an uh, editor. So once you are logged in, you can see this, uh, go to click on the avatar, your avatar on the right. And then to settings when you are in your account settings you will see on the left side left side there is uh, there is an option called ssh and gpg keys you click on this ssh and gpg keys when you click there you will see uh, i already have two keys in my screen but you might have nothing you just click on new ssh key which means you want to add a new ssh key which means you are trying to connect a new host to your hosted repository and what we have to do is we have to just copy this content of the public key, which is id underscore rsa dot pub, not the one which does not have the pub. That is a private key. You have to copy the public key here and and the Windows key. So I got this new key added. Now from here. I can run my git clone command. So I will just create, come out to the outside directory. So create a, let me just change the font size. It's very small. Right, so I'll just create a new directory, let's say. Right, and here I can run the command from the slide, which is, let me just go back to the slide deck. This one, this one, sorry. Git clone for the web server git. Now there is one thing to note is if you see I'm using this git SSH uh, for git clone, you can you also use HTTP or git cloning and there is a if you use HTTPs it doesn't give you by default the right permission okay so probably I cannot type it I'll just do a git clone and I can use it from here I can go back to my repo I mean, the, the, the best place is how you can do is, is if there is any public repo, like in this case, let's say this is web server two, you access the repo from on the GitLab or any hosted repository and you have this green button called clone or download. And if you click here, it's going to give you two options, clone with SSH or clone using HTTPS. I mean, the recommended way is use SSH always, because if you use SSH, you can always also write into the repository. And if you use HTTP, at the time of writing, you will have to switch from HTTPS to SSH. And then if you click here on this little, uh, but then it will actually copy it for you. And you can come back here. And hopefully. Yeah, and then run this. And now what it means is actually, okay, I didn't say yes. so. What it means is now from this host and my, and the hosted repo, they are connected. I can actually work on my Git, can do the development from this host and push my changes to the hosted repo. So I have established a connection between the hosted repo and my working machine. So every time I change it, I will have to do it. So this is the basic setup. 
All right, now I'm going to just uh, look at some question. Could you go, or so for it, could you please go over the step after we pasted the public key out in the GitHub repo page? So once, okay, I will just redo this. So when we pasted the repo, we actually wanted the link to do a clone. So if you go back on the slide, the command we are using is git and it's for because we're using git clone is to basically clone the repo. And what we want is for any public repo is this URL. And this URL we can get from GitHub uh, repository page. So every GitHub repository. So in my case, I went to my repository here. And from this repository, I clicked on, the, I had two repository, lab two and web server. I clicked on the web server repository. And then, and this is basically my hosted repository page. And here I clicked on this clone or download. And when I click on this one, it gives me an option to either clone with STD SSH or clone with HTTPS. And here, if you click on this little icon, it's basically going to actually copy this URL for you. And what I did is I click here, copied the URL, and then paste it back into the Git Bash window here. Uh, let's clone it. Now, this is not, you can do it only for uh, my repo. Oh, sorry. So I, I basically lost the windows. Uh, I should use my machine a second. Let's connect. I mean, I can show you here is generally once once I'm here, uh, what I wanted to show is what you have learned is not just because of this, for this repo. Now, let's say I want to go and search for a public repo of, uh, of any, any public repo for a product. So, what I what I'm going to do is let's uh, I'm going to let's say go here and search for any open source project. Let's say mm, Firefox, and I will say Firefox okay. GitHub. So this is actually now what I'm looking at here is the one second. Uh, this is uh, this is not a Firefox repository. So the name of the repository is here: Tree Herder Active dot Mozilla Community, like this. So let me maybe see this Mozilla. And inside Mozilla, I think these are like plugins. Mozilla, Mozilla Central. This repo. So you can see these are comments about the repo. So what I wanted to show is maybe uh, I have to, yeah, this is, let's say Firefox uh, Mozilla iOS. So this is Firefox iOS uh, repo, which is open source. And what you can do is you can actually go here, click on this little link. Uh, and here it is HTTPS, should it still work? And I can just go and do git clone. And what is going to is going to bring this whole source code of Firefox iOS into my laptop. And I can start building it. Which means right once I is trying to download this. So this is if you see this whole code is once it is downloaded, I will do the size for this directory to see what is the code base. This itself is, is, a, is a big project, but we'll look at the size. And you can see how many contributors, there are 169 contributors to this one. Let me show a project of a bigger size, maybe uh, what we can say is Kubernetes. Or maybe let's look at Ansible. I mean, these, these are like DevOps tool chain and these are big tools uh, and here, Ansible, Ansible. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is an automation tool and you can see it has almost 5,000 contributors and it has 304 releases. Uh, you can see how many branches are there. Uh, so, and this is under GPL, which means anybody can download this and 
use it for their own purpose. So this is, and you can you can do exactly the same what we did with this one. Oh, sorry, uh, click here. What we did with Firefox, if you want to contribute to Ansible development, you can go click to do clone download. You can do the same thing and you will have whole source code for Ansible. You can go inside here. I mean, if you want to navigate here, you can navigate here. If you want to basically do and run this on your local, you can do this. So right now it's still downloading. Uh, might be a little bit big. So uh, that's, that's what it is about. So here, I mean, you can see uh, generally uh, the idea, I will also walk through a bit of a repository, how the repositories are organized. So every repo will have a readme. You see this readme file? every repo should have a readme. I mean, this is something very basic. Whenever you're trying to host a public repo, just three basic files are needed. Readme file, a license file, because you are actually creating a public repo, so you need to have a license file. It's not mandatory, but if you don't have it, which means then anybody can use it as they wish, because you haven't specified. So, uh, and then after that, you will have your own, like uh, source code file, directory structure, whatever you like. And this readme file, you give the information for anybody who doesn't know about uh, what is the objective purpose, how to run it, uh, these information here. So like, for example, right now it is like the stable risk 2.0 is a stable release, but they are actually doing the third, I think three release. So here I can see, you can see the branches as well. I click on the branch here and you can see these are the releases 1.5, 1.51. 1 so all these are releases and all these releases are in open source. So if you want, if anybody's, uh, these are the oldest release, the newest release is 2.1.0 debug 2.9. So if let's say there is a, you are working on Ansible and what you, you hit a bug on 2.9, then the next thing what you will do is you will go and download, you click on 2.8. And now when you click, once you are on 2.8, you can click clone here and here you will have, you will get a clone of 2.8. You can also do this after cloning it in your local repo as well. You can switch it. All you have to do is run a git fetch. You will look into those commands, right? So you can give your email. Now somebody has a question is, do we need to give an email address when we're generating the key? You can give your email address. Yes, it's a good practice. Uh, you can you can keep it empty as well. If you keep it empty, then you will have to uh, define your uh, your username and, and uh, email address in uh, Git global variables. So we'll we'll cover this part of the next. So now let's get into some basic concept. What actually how the Git works? Because I think there are many questions coming about what happens if I commit and if somebody else is working. So what is the advantage of the Git? Git basically. Uh, it basically presents us with a working directory, which, which means when we cloned it, we got a working directory. And then there is a staging area. That means uh, we have actually worked on certain files and they are ready. Uh, I mean, we have worked it multiple times. We have added one line. We were not happy. We changed it. We added second line. Then we are not happy. We, and then those, those changes are in the staging areas when we are happy. And then when we do commit, what means is at the time of commit, that snapshot of that particular file is created locally and the pointer to that snapshot is stored in the commit. So that is where we say head, the, and we'll come back to that. So this is what the, the Git provides us. A working directory, you can add file, you can remove file, you can do whatever you like. Everything is locally. Whatever changes you are doing is, there is no, absolutely no impact on the hosted repository. If you screw it up, if you remove a few files and then you mess it up, you can just remove the clean up the whole directory and reclone it. Let me show this. So for example, uh, my Firefox, this is my Firefox iOS clone, but this is, let me see the size. I said I will show you the size of this. Repo. So this is the big project and it still is half a GB around 572 MB. Uh, and let's it will have a let's see this one so for my web server is let's say i was working on this file i'm on the master branch and and let's say by mistake i remove app all the app files so now i have lost i've lost my files what do i do now so 
I was trying to do the changes. So uh, one way is I can recover individual file, but I've actually messed it up uh, big time. I can just remove the whole web server directory and run my git clone command again. And then again, I have a brand new refresh clone from the master, all the files back here. Uh, can also restore it. So this, I mean, this is what I was trying to show is here. Uh, one second, there is a question. So I've already pasted this, okay, fine. So there's one question is what is exact advantage of the staging area? I mean, working directory can be committed once changes are done directly. Uh, no one, the working directory, okay, let me show this. Uh, maybe I can show this better. So this is my working directory. And let's say I create a new file. So I will create a test file, let's say, and I will just add something here. Now this file, if I do ls minus l, this is my working directory. My working directory has a test file but my staging area doesn't have a test file because Git doesn't know there is a test file as well. So this is a difference. I can have files which are not part of my repository. So in order for me to add this test file, I will have to run certain Git command to move it to the staging area. And if you see here is from working directory, you will stage the fixes. You will bring it to the staging area. Once it is in the staging area, then only the commit is going to basically add it to the repo. So if I try to do git commit on the test, it's not going to work. So it says test does not match any file known to git. So git doesn't know about test. So that is why we need uh, the working directory is where we are working. And then we will have to move to files to the staging. And once they are staging, then we can actually commit. Right, I hope that answers your question. Uh, now, what happens in terms of data flow? So, I mean, uh, right now for this slide purpose, I mean, if you can just keep in mind that whenever you are, whenever you are cloning your Git repo, you will have a working directory or you will have a staging area. And then when you commit, it's also in your local directory. So this, this is how the, the Git uh, has different areas, because we will use this terminology more and more in the future right now. Now, coming back to, uh, the data flow, how the data flows is, you can see here is whenever we do commit, it is always in the local repository. So people, I mean, if you are like uh, from an old development background and you have used centralized version control, maybe clear case, CVS. I mean, in that case, when we used to do commit, it was going on to the, the hosted repository, centralized server. But here, when we do commit, it basically goes into the local repository. So there was a question where where somebody was asking is if I basically do a do a clone again and if I mess it up, will I lose my changes? You will not lose your changes if you have done a commit in local repository. Anything which is commit can be retrieved. Anything which is indexed, I mean, which is in the staging and not committed will be lost. So that is why whenever uh, the Git recommends to do frequent commits, so when you do frequent commits, you can always restore it back to that commit and all the commits are in your local repositories. Working directory and the local directory is, I mean, yes, the in terms of the directory name, it is the same, it is the same folder path, but the reference, uh, it's a local repository. I mean, if you see here in the flow, it says local repository, which means the local copy of the files with git version control git commands are also running in those directory which means git is maintaining version control locally software uh, and the local working directory is where where you're actually is your code is so in this flow is the more commit you do the git software locally is going to take a snapshot and do a commit tag to that particular uh, file and if for any reason you mess it up, you will be able to restore to your any commits, not even the last commit, you can also restore to your previous commit as well. Now, when you are now, when you are actually uh, ready with your feature, you can you can push it to your remote repository. When you push this feature, it has been uh, made available to everyone as well. And from there, you can actually do a pull or rebase. So 
once you see the yellow line it has gone to the remote repository and when you do a pull it will basically bring from the repo remote repository so what happened is you did multiple commits and you think okay i have, i am probably finishing up my day's work then you can do a push and the same thing which was in your local repository exactly same thing goes on the repo, remote you come in the next day morning and your laptop is not booting or for some reason you left your laptop at home and you are in a different place and you want to work on your code you just log in uh, from any laptop you log into your github account you basically do a pull and you get exactly the same code base in your new laptop and you can continue working now that's that's a few of the advantages uh, so you can do pull you can, when you do fetch so there is a command which is fetch fetch is going to bring it to the local and then you can actually either uh, use the latest version, your index version, which is in the staging, or you can work from the one which is committed. And you can take the diff, and you can see what what where you were actually in the phase of the development. Now let me just pick up a few question. So there is a question is, let's say there is a server and my laptop, and I do frequent commits, but my hard disk crashes. Can you please help me visualize it? Okay. So what will happen is you have done frequent commits and you have not done the push which means everything was in this green one which is local repository and because your laptop crashed it cannot be recovered everything was local if you would have done the push then you can pull it from the hosted repository so frequent commit is going to help you to restore your work to the previous on the local but in order for your work not to be lost in case of a crash of a laptop, do push, frequent push. Uh, no, uh, so the question is, but push may require conflict resolution? No, the conflict resolution only comes when we do merging. We are not doing any merging here. Everything, he, all this workflow is in your feature branch. So nothing has been gone to anywhere else. It's, it's, it's all your work either it is on your local or is on your hosted repository or branch and it is not conflicting anything with anyone right now the next thing is what i wanted to do is uh, i think we have done step one which is uh, you have got the hosted repository and your look at local development uh, host connected and next thing is very important to know whether when you are working in a working directory you are working on which branch so if you see the current slide now here by default when i log in i'm on the master when i did a git clone and i go inside the directory it will show me the master branch the first thing is it should show me right so for this we need to configure our local bash environment the shell environment either you can configure this uh, shell environment or let's say not everybody likes to develop in on the shell or text editor and people might use Eclipse or PyCharm or Visual Studio Code. Now Git provides a very good integration with almost all the integrated development environments. And what it means is, I've given you one example of Bash, but if you are also on Visual Studio Code, let me show you this one. So here, I mean, this is one of the repo which we are looking at. Here it says, this is my feature branch. If you can see here where a mouse is, it's a, it says it's a i'm working on a branch which is called feature ashok page and it is this little star which means that my work is in progress there are things in the staging which is not committed so similar to this i can actually add a new file you see there is a little m here this dot is if you see this file is untracked so the idea is what happens is it will show you different status and all the id provides that because Git is really very simple and straightforward. Most of the IDs implement uh, like even better integration with Git. What I've given below is a very basic one, which is for Bash because for the purpose of our, uh, for our development, we will not be going into very large scale development. In fact, we want to see is how it works. And then even if I cover, let's say, Visual Studio Code, somebody will like PyCharm and somebody wants Eclipse. So it's more like uh, there's a different altogether section is how you can set up integration with uh, different uh, Git IDs. But uh, for the purpose of our uh, lab and work, I mean, 
this is a below it's a code in this slide let me paste this uh, here to everyone and if you put this code into your bash rc or in your shell prompt and you source it you will get a prompt like i have shown here which means you will have uh, i mean this is what you get i will let me show you my terminal here so you will see the username your host name the directory and then the branch and this little star is there is a work in progress because i've added test so if i do if i remove test you see the star is gone because there is this uh, and i can check with the status so sure that my branch is up to date so there is there is nothing in my directory which is not synchronized with the branch i'm working on so uh, so it's better to have this kind of a visualization because if you don't have this essentially you will only see web server and you will have to keep that in my in your head that which branch you are working on and it is very easy to do the changes in a different branch rather than the one in your branch and then you lose a lot of work in that case so uh, this is uh, one of the environment the next i wanted to show was about the visual studio code i mean this is a free it's a the freeware for vs code uh, even PyCharm has a has a development version which is freer as well. So the idea, the generally these IDEs integration with Git are very straightforward. Once you actually log in into, you open a file into your. Uh, once you basically open a file into your directory where you have initialized Git, it will just create this uh, branch directory. So let me show you how it works inside this. I have a dot git directory and inside dot git uh, I have all these files and there is the main file I want is the config. So this config file basically uh, tells me that which is my my master is my merge and I have actually fetched the remote origin. So it's telling me which branch I'm working on branch master remote origin and this is where it basically gets its uh, branch name. So all these IDs basically parse this directory, fetch all the information, and then display you on the ID. Git integration with terminal is the same because, uh, I mean, if you're using bash shell, then it's fine. If you're using some other shell, then you will have to you add, these, uh, add these functions into that uh, profile of your uh, shell. So if you're using ZSH, you will use uh, other profile file. So, I mean, simply uh, if the idea is if you're using bash, you can do something like bash profile. And you can add these lines here. I mean, these are the lines. And what will happen is it will actually give you some better presentation of your prompt from the point of view. Like if you see, I'm working here and I'm going. And as long as there is no git initialization, there is the, these directory that doesn't have any git code. And let's say if I go on Firefox, and you see it brings the master because it actually goes and reads the config file and it determines which branch I'm working on right now. I mean, let me just show you one more feature why this is very handy and is important is, let's say here on my VS code, I was working on this branch called feature Ashok hyphen page. So let me switch to that branch. So I will say hit checkout and the name of the branch. And okay, maybe there's a typo. Okay, so if I don't know, simple thing is I will do a fetch. It is going to bring me all the branches. Okay, because this branch has not been pushed on the on the repo server, there is no such branch here. So I will have to basically let's do a create a branch. So I will do a branch and let's say test. I created a new branch and I will say git checkout test. 
sorry, typo. Let me look it. And you see this branch is now changed to test. So this is easy for me. Uh, I mean, and even, yeah, okay. So, th so this way actually we know which branch we are working on and uh, if if you basically want to go back to the git, if you want to go back to master, just to get check out master. And let's delete it because we don't need it. So remove the, right. So I mean, uh, that's why I, I wanted, uh, that you need these kind of environments to make your life easier because you might be working in multiple branches and, and doing the wrong changes in the wrong place. But what I'm trying to say is no matter which which way you want to do it, Git provides a good integration. You might have to spend like an hour or two, but in the end it's worth it based on, I mean, analysis. So let's close this. Let's move on to the next. So we'll, we'll cover some fundamental here. I mean, this is basically how to use it, how to work with Git. And here we are going to, uh, uh, cover certain things. So first thing first is uh, uh, first thing first is we can actually create a repository in multiple ways. So what we just saw was cloning. That means there was already a an repository. Somebody has worked in and we wanted to copy the code. But what about that we have a project and what we have a project and we want to create a repository. We want to use version control on that project. So like somebody was doing development old style, but now he wants to use get something like this. Uh, so there is, so sorry, um, I, will, I will pick up the, the questions once I do this slide. So let the keep questions coming in. I will just address all in one go in, in five minutes. So what git in it does is basically, it initializes the repository. What what it does basically, it will uh, set up the git dot config file. It will create uh, the environment that is needed to maintain. They do the snapshot of the files in the directory. It will maintain the head pointers and it will do all the necessary admin work what is needed to do the version control. So git in it is the command. It is always run any kind of repository whenever it is created. Even git clone when we do. It basically do an init and after that it'll start copying the file. So uh, if there is like a directory where you have certain files which you want to make the part of the repository, the best thing is you go into the directory, you run the git in it. And then next step is if you want to actually push it to the to your actually uh, hosted repository, then you can do a remote add. That means you add, you, you have to create that repository remotely and then you push this file to that master branch of that repository. So that is the third command, which is here is git remote add origin. And then this is your GitHub, your username, because you are trying to create a new repository and the name of the repo. And then you push it to that repo. So this way you can actually start. I mean, there are, there are multiple ways to do this. So in, in DevOps, I mean, this is how generally you will fall like uh, understand is there are multiple ways of doing the same thing. There is absolutely no one uh, perfect way of doing it. So you can do this exactly creating of a new repository. You can do it from the UI. You can do it from command line and push it. Or you can do using based on API. You can write an API code to do the same thing. So you can do from anywhere you like. So this is a few commands from the command prompt. I can show you exactly, I can show you both ways. Uh, I mean, I think this is part of the lab as well. So let's do it as part of lab. Uh, so this is, this is the next lab is, what the idea was of the next lab was is, what you will do is you will have a directory in which let's say you have a very simple code, maybe a one line code, something like this. Let's say I'm here and lab and let's say this is, lab two and okay, it's already there. So forget about this. What I'm trying to show is an empty directory. So I create a new directory, let's say, which is my So 
So I created a lab too. And you see, there is, it's not showing me any branch, nothing. And I run get in it. So that means it has initialized the get, get for me. And I can do now git. So I, I, if I go dot get, and I can see that I have got the structure now for the get. So I got the config, I got everything. So this is this is a, like a step one for any repository. Now, what I do is I do git commit minus dot. What I'm trying to say is basically tag my directory only, nothing else. Okay, so actually I'm here. Second. Maybe we'll have to just do the push first. So I'll just do this. Mm. I will create the repo on the hosted repository first. Let's say. So it has created the repo and I'm going to push it now to the master branch of that repo. Maybe I have to give the right name. Okay, so probably I've used the same name again, which is probably the problem. Let's create a Uh, I think we might have to create a file. So I've added it to the staging now, and now I can do comment. Right, so. So I mean, if if okay. So right now it's good that we are having a problem. So this is the time when we can learn. So right now what is happening is uh, we have initialized the local repo. We have configured the look remote repo to be named as lab three. And when we are trying to do push to the master branch of the repo, it is giving an error. Either it's saying repository is not found or it is saying is uh, yeah. Uh, so we can actually go and check on our repository host what is the situation so here you can go here you can see what the repos are and it seems the repo is not created here so for some reason this command uh, uh, I will I will debug this one I mean, you guys can try it. Uh, generally, the idea is you should be able to create a create a repo from here and push it onto the master. Now, if that doesn't work, the other work is other way to do the same thing is 
you can create it from here. So you can just say, let's say, like for example, I don't want to use the same, I will just say lab four. I will say new lab four name and say test exercise. And you can make this repo as private or public. So here, I mean, let's keep it public. If you don't want any anybody else to see this repo just for you, you can make it private. So this means all your development work is only visible to you. It's not visible to the world. And when on the date when you want to change it, you can make it public. So you can either keep it. It's just that you want to keep your uh, copy of your local repo into the hosted repo. Now for this purpose, let's keep it public. And it can give you an option to initialize uh, uh, with a readme. You can just add a license file by itself. And it's exactly the same command which we we're trying to run remotely. And what it has done is it has actually created a repo which is called lab4 here and with these files. And what I can do from here is now, this is actually what happened is from web UI, it has created the git in it. Can go back and I can do git clone. And this time I can clone the lab4, which is here. And whatever file was there has now in my local. Yeah. So the two files we just created. Now, okay, we had a little issue when we were trying to. Okay, uh, let me try this command. Yes, I think there is some problem even with that. Uh, okay, so I think I will look into it. So it's probably some parameter which is not configured in my local environment, which is causing it not to push it. So, I mean, we can take a pause here and which is after, let me go back to the slide session, which is we have we have done with the lab two. We will we'll continue with this uh, lab two of uh, uh, the command line option. And then we can start, we will start from setting up uh, the configuration for the repository. This this can be probably the reason why it was not working, but we'll see in the next slide, uh, next session.